page 265. Good to see you. What a good day. Good to be in the Lord's house again. Page 265. Sing with us. Stand if you will. Sing with all your heart. Are you happy? Amen. Ready? All right, here we go. Sing for you now. Better than anything, ask the ushers to come and we'll come for this evening's tithes and offerings. You give as the Lord's blessed. On the first, I will sing deep in sin, far from the peaceful soul.
head. Me sound pretty. Pray for us, Henry. thankful for what the Lord's done for me. We had a good Christmas with our family. It was so good to have all of our family here this morning, have Jason in town and Uncle Jimmy, and just continue to pray for him. Um, He's been through a lot, and uh, just thankful that, you know, he's still faithful, and he still um, makes it to the house of the Lord, and um, with our young people, we went out and caroled a little bit, and uh, we got to go see Miss Marzi, and uh, it was right after she got home from her surgery, and um, as the kids were singing, we thought they were just going to open the door, and as they started to sing out, she came, and she sat on the front porch, and I'm just so thankful uh, that the kids got an opportunity to sing to her, and then we gathered around and prayed with her, and uh, it was just such a sweet time and such a blessing, and so I'm just thankful for all the Lord's done for me and what we've been allowed to share with the kids and love on them a little bit, and um I'm just thankful for family and for friends that love you like family and take you in when you have no place to go. And so, uh, and that's what Bill and Helen do for me and mom every year on Christmas Day. Our Christmas Eve is what we do a lot with our family, but on Christmas Day, they kind of take us in and they love on us and we appreciate that. And so I I encourage you, you know, if you you know somebody that doesn't have a place to go, just invite people in and make them a part of your family. That's what we always feel like whether they want us there or not no I'm just kidding (laughs) but we'll sing a few and get out of the way Satan whispers in my ear why don't you just
this mountain The sun is shining bright My heart is filled with gladness Here above the cares of life For I've just come through a valley Of trouble, fear, and pain It was there I came to know my God Enough to stand and say That even in the valley God is good And even in the valley He is faithful and true He carries His children through Like He said He would And even in the valley God is good Aren't you thankful for all that the Lord has done and how good he's been? This road of life has led you to a valley of defeat. You wonder if the Father has heard your desperate plea. Well, there's hope in that rugged place where tears of sorrow dwell. Can't you hear him gently whispering, I'm here and all is well. For even in the valley, God is good. And even in the valley, he is faithful and true. He cares. sing this next song for Miss Ann. She talked to me the other day and was telling me how when she's going through the treatments, all that just kept going through her mind is when you're going through those difficult times just to, to praise his name. And, you know, that's right. No matter what we're going through in our life, if we can just praise the Lord through it all, I think when we come out on the other side, that blessing is just going to be so much greater. And so, Miss Ann, I want to sing this for you tonight. to walk and your mountain seems so tall and you realize life's not always fair you can run away and hide or let the old man decide or you can change your circumstances with a prayer When everything falls apart, praise His name. When you have a broken heart, just raise your hands and say, Lord, you're all I need. You're everything to me. 
and you'll take the pain away when it seems you're all alone praise his name when you feel you can't go on just raise your hands and say greater is he that is within and praise the hurt away if you'll just praise his Appreciate that good singing. Sweet message there. I can't think of a better place to be the last Sunday of the year than right here in God's house. Amen. Hey, I'm excited to be here. Looking forward to a new year. Man, didn't Hoy do a great job this morning preaching? Man, that was a powerful message. I appreciate that, Hoy. I love you, brother. Listen, my message tonight may echo some of those same points, but you know what? I believe God's trying to tell us something. Amen. Now, I love... The end of the year and, and all the, the lists that come with it. You know, the top plays of 2015. The top news stories and so on. And so I thought this week that I would make a list of my own. And uh, I'm going to ask, I think the fellow's going to help me out here on the screen. These are the top Free Will Baptist Church signs of 2015 in my opinion. All right. So. Here we go. And I like this one right off the bat. Start your year right. Be in church. Amen? Yep. What a friend we have in Jesus. Yeah. Hey. God went soul custody, not weekend visitation. <laughs> hey. Do more than forgive, forget. New sign, same message, Jesus saves. <laughs> Aren't you glad some things never changed? Yeah. Jesus, don't leave earth without him. I was going to waste, but Jesus recycled me. 
The Easter Bunny didn't rise from the dead. <laughs> Church parking violators will be baptized. <laughs> it's sunlight saving time. God shows no favoritism, but our sign guy does. Go Bama. Where's, where's Brother Steve tonight? I think he'd appreciate that. <laughs> That's my buddy up here. Here's my favorite. I was addicted to the hokey pokey, but I turned myself around. <laughs> Ah, oh, I'm kidding. I, don't, I found that one on the internet and put it up there. <laughs> but I wanted to share that one. Amen. Uh, and I'm not sure quite how to follow the hokey pokey there. But as we put 2015 in the rearview mirror and stare out our windshield towards 2016, we recognize and know there's going to be challenges as well as opportunities that a new year brings. Amen. A year for some to start some new things. For others, maybe to wipe the slate clean and begin a fresh season in their life. For others, maybe a time to build upon foundations that have been laid already. But to all of us, it's another measure of time to grow in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen. If you have your Bibles tonight, turn to the book of Lamentations. Lamentations. Old Testament, Lamentations chapter 3. I'd like to look at... Uh, Two verses, verses 22 and 23. Once you'd fi have found that, I'd ask you to stand. Reading of God's Word. <laughs> All right, looks like most of us are there. Limitations 3, verses 22 and 23. The Bible says... It is of the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. Verse 23, they are new every morning. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for another opportunity to preach your word. Thank you for our church. Lord, we pray your presence tonight as we seek you. Lord, help us to meet the challenges of a new year. Lord, grow us through every opportunity that you provide. Lord, prepare us to become the person that you want us to be. Thank you for that your compassions fail not, Lord. We need them new each day. Because of that, Lord, our, our yesterdays and our failures and our defeats, our shortcomings, they don't have to define us. Dear God, we praise you that the blood still has the same power in 2016 that it did the day that it stained the old rugged cross. Lord, help us to determine in our hearts to serve you faithfully in 2016. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The yearly transition is kind of a natural time for assessment and for inventory taking. It's a time to, to check our progress and take a, a, a fresh look at our priorities. And I think most would agree that once in a while, it's good to take a step back and look at the big picture in our lives. And so listen, we often get tangled in the daily details and lose our sense of long term. Lose our sense of the eternal and the forever. And so there are benefits in giving yourselves an annual or yearly checkup or an occasional evaluation. Amen. Ultimately, I hope everyone in here tonight can say, I want to be the man or woman, boy or girl that God wants me to be and has created me to be. And so as we kind of take a look, as we kind of look into hearts and souls and, and minds, we'll see that, that many need some adjustments in our lives. Hey, areas we need to let God work on. Maybe we need to let him tweak some of our strengths, but maybe we need, need some complete renovations in some of the areas we struggle with. Now, I like watching those home renovation shows. Anybody with me in here? You know, seeing the old fixer-upper turned into the dream home. You know, it's fun to watch the process. Listen, God's in that business as well, but not necessarily with houses. Yes, with homes, but it's in lives and in people that he makes these transformations. Amen? So the, the trending word or the hot word for New Year's is resolutions. All right? Many make these New Year's resolutions or they set goals with plans of, of improvement. And statistics show, whether you like it or not, 
it's a good thing to set some goals in your life. Specifically, it's a good thing for those who sit down and write out their resolutions or goals. Because you see, numbers say they are much more likely to follow through and achieve those goals or to work towards those goals. And, then, and I'm not a genius by any stretch, but if something works, you know, I'd like to try it. I want to put it into action. And so I've already have a partial list of some goals for 2016. You know, some, some things I want to work towards, some things I'm going to pray for, things I'm willing to fast for, some things I'd like to see happen in my life, in my family, in my ministry, and in my church. Amen? Some things I can't do, but I know God can. Amen? Amen? I like to put a few things on my list, see, that I could never do, but I know that God can. And by faith, I pray, expecting Him to move. Amen? No doubt there are skeptics who would chuckle at a thought like that. And we may not reach all our dreams, all our goals, all our aspirations. Not all dreams come to pass. But I'm convinced, listen now, far too often we settle for less than God is willing to do for us because we fail to pray, to ask, and to work towards goals. We fail to believe and expect things to happen. Amen? Let me give you a visual on that. There's a brand new youth building right across the parking lot out here. And that's been on my list for quite some time, and I know many others as well. Listen, we're about to be in it. Amen? That's exciting. That's a goal that has been reached. At one time, that, that seemed impossible. But it's here, and it's close. And we've got reason to praise Him and thank Him tonight, right? God has blessed. Listen, now that that goal has been reached, the new goal is this. To see it furnished and equipped and paid for. Listen, I'm believing it. I'm expecting it. Hey, and let me share. I think there's enough finances represented in our church, in our winter visitors, in our camp meeting folks. They can make that happen. Amen? You say that's a big goal. I say I have a big God. Amen? Amen? So we have very specific goals and resolutions as well as having general goals and resolutions and things to work towards. And so I'd like to share five of those general goals and resolutions that can be beneficial in every Christian's life. Listen, without direction, without plan, without thought, we'll drift, we'll wander. And I tell the youth group often, direction determines your destination. Direction determines your destination. It's true in a car, if you're driving, if you're walking, if you're biking, but listen, especially in life, the direction you're heading determines your, your destination, where you're going to end up. The Apostle Paul indicates in Philippians 3.14, he is pressing towards the mark. He is headed for a certain direction, towards the high calling of God. Listen, you have to have your life headed in the right di direction to end up in heaven one day. Amen? And so five helpful New Year's resolutions to keep us headed in that right direction. Things we need more of in our lives paired with things we need less of. So number one, in 2016, we need to be more of a Barnabas and less of a Saul. And let me, let me explain that for you. Many are familiar with the life of King Saul. Um, and like many of us, Saul had a lot of issues going on in his life. But much of his trouble took root in the fact that he had a hard time trusting and obeying what God told him to do. Yeah. You see, God would often give him specific instructions, and he wouldn't follow him all the way through. He would start, but he wouldn't finish through. And at some point, he felt that he knew better than God. Right. Listen, and he began to do his own thing instead of God's thing. And, and he very well looked the part. Listen, he was described as being noble and having a great stature. Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned some 42 years. All of a sudden, David comes on the scene, and we know this story. He kills Goliath, and he becomes Israel's national hero. And Saul cast a jealous eye towards David. And you know what? A little sin crept in. A little envy came on the scene. And that little envy ends up consuming him. That little sin, listen, sin 
was a downhill spiral for Saul that cost him his throne, cost him his crown, and cost him his life. Right. Listen, Saul thought he could manage it. Saul thought he was in control. Saul thought he knew best. Many think they know best. They know better than God. Yeah, they may start off thinking they're following God's path, but at some point, they think they know better than God. They think they can manage their lives better than God. They think they can manage sin. Amen? And they think if they can keep it manageable, they're okay. Yeah, I can handle this. I'm all right. And they don't want to turn from it by pulling it up roots and all. So you know what they do? They mow over it. They mow over it. I think all of us can identify with a lawnmower. And they mow over it. But it keeps growing. It keeps coming back. And the roots grow deeper. Amen? Sin destroyed Saul. Even though it had small beginnings, because it wasn't dealt with, it grew and it spread. Sin in our lives. No matter how small, how innocent it may seem, it'll root and it'll grow. And if not dealt with, it can consume you. Listen, many addicts, there's a lot of things in this world to be addicted to in this day and time. But many addicts start with something that seems pretty manageable. But it soon, grow, soon grows out of control. Sin is progressive like that. Listen, it, takes, it keeps taking more and more and more ground in your life. Amen? And sin will control decisions you make in your life. Left unchecked, sin can bury you alive and rob you of your soul. How tragic is that? Listen, there should be no room for sin in the life of a Christian. Listen, when those roots of sin show up, we got to deal with it. we got to remove it, roots and all. Don't just mow over it and let it go. Deal with it. When it shows its face. Amen. Listen, and as we root sin out of our lives, because it'll come, we need to replace it and plant some things that are worthy to grow. Amen. Like encouragement. Like encouragement. That's where Barnabas comes on the scene. Now, Barnabas means son of consolation or exhortation. In other words, Barnabas was an encourager, brother. He was the person that you love to run into when you were out somewhere. Amen. When you left talking to him, you felt better than when he came. All right. Proverbs 18, 21 tells us this, that the tongue has the power of life and death. That's a pretty heavy statement. But listen, negative words have a long term shelf life. Here's what I mean by that. I've talked to some folks and people can re recount in exact words, in vivid detail, Things that were said to them some 20, 30, even 40 years or longer that cut them deeply. That's a long time. Listen, the first time a school child is called ugly or fat or made fun of, that leaves a deep impression. Listen, the, the sinking feeling when you realize you're the brunt of somebody's cruel joke, that hurts. That hurts. Now, many have had critical parents. And maybe as a child, you were called useless, or unwanted, or an accident, or a burden. Listen, those are words that hurt, and they stick, and they cause damage. And, and no doubt, we've all been on the end of harsh words in our lives. And those negative points, they are sharp, and they're hurtful, and they can stick for years, and years, and years. Negative words can make a lifelong impact. It's no wonder that Scripture warns us to bridle our tongue. Amen? We've got to be careful what we say. I've seen a young person's self-esteem crumble when berated by one of their parents. I've seen marriages disintegrate over the constant critical language used in the home. Amen? A family torn apart, friendships ruined when spiteful or hurtful words are spoken. And like gunshots, like a gun shoots a bullet, once those negative words leave our mouths, they can't be recaught. They can't be recaptured. Like a bomb exploding, words are the shrapnel that leaves all the damage behind. Our words do carry the power of life and death. But thank God, 
Here's the beauty of it. Our words don't have to be negative. Amen? There's a, a good side to this. Barnabas realized this. And he spoke life into others by the words he used. So the opposite of those negative words are the positive ones. And just as we can tear somebody down with words, we can also build them up. Listen, my nephew Andrew is here somewhere. He's always been good at building things with these little blocks, Legos. Amen? And I think it's pretty cool. And he's got some cool stuff from, that he's made since he was little. And he even got some this year for Christmas to keep on building. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> I have about enough Lego skill to build a wall. That's, that's where my skill ends. But Andrew gets these Legos, and he builds stuff that are cool. He sees what, what's inside of it. He sees what can become of the Legos. And I thought, man, if we could use our words like these Legos, and to build something, to be constructive with them, to, to compliment and encourage and build, to reinforce positive things that people do, to bring out things maybe isn't obvious. Um, and I thought words like those Legos could be made to build something. And Barnabas, brother, he was so good, if he were using Legos, he could work at Legoland. <laughs> Amen. Now, I know we have a Legoland right here in Winter Haven. I've never been to it. Most of you with kids or grandkids probably have. But I did have the opportunity when, when our boys were young, we went to uh, Legoland out near San Diego. And it's literally unbelievable what they can build with these Legos. Man, huge structures. And I'm telling you some amazing things. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Google things built with Legos and you will see. But guess what? You know, that's amazing and that's cool. But here's the application. Our words can also build some amazing things in people's lives. Hey, a, a word kindly spoken can make someone's day. How powerful. Listen, a genuine compliment by a coworker or somebody that's close to you, it's better than a Starbucks cup of coffee, hey amen? And it won't cost you six bucks either. <laughs> but listen, letting a young person know that, hey, I believe in you, man, it can change the course of their life. And I've seen this happen. Oh, Brother, there is power in our words. We can speak life into people. Now, I love getting gift cards. And thank you for those that, that gave us a gift or a gift card for Christmas. They are greatly appreciated. But I thought of positive words also are like gift cards. Man, they're a blessing to get. And they can be used immediately or they can be tucked away and used at a later time. Amen? Kind words do the same thing. They give immediate gratification, but they can also be stored away in the mind and the memory. And if hard times come, man, they can pull those out and rely on those and trust in those and be consoled by those. So kind words are powerful. Listen, my wife, Deb, she's the elementary PE teacher here at SCA, here at school. So elementary PE teacher. The kids think she's like a superhero or a rock star or something. You know, just walk around campus a few minutes with Deb, and you'll hear, Miss Debbie, Miss Debbie, Miss Debbie, you know. And then you're going to have to stop like every few minutes as she gets multiple hugs from everybody under four foot tall, okay? They actually love a teacher who lets them run around, scream, and have fun. <laughs> but Deb and, and all the other teachers in, in, in elementary here at school, they give out positive awards. I, I think it's each week. It could be... Uh, every so often, but I'm not sure. But it's basically just a little piece of paper, and it gives the kids an encouragement. Um, but you know what? It builds them up. And I've sat in on elementary chapels, and, man, they get called up in chapel, and they're handed that little piece of paper. But, man, the grins and the smiles and the encouragement you see that it gives them. And, and I know I'm really pushing this point. Maybe it's because this is on my list of 2016 to be better at. But... Uh, I'm going to do something. Now, when you work with young folks, you, you realize that, that props get attention. And like I said, I want to work at being a great encourager. You know, sometimes visual aids help in getting your message across. And I can probably guarantee you've not seen this before. And I didn't have a practice run, but it's New Year's. And I thought, in 2016, I would love for my words 
to rain down like confetti <laughs> all this year. Amen? And I promised to clean that up. <laughs> all right, so you're never going to forget the night confetti flew in church. <laughs> but what if we could rain encouragement down on others like that confetti? Just spread it out and let it fly. Let it land and let it bring smiles and happiness. Listen, I've got a question for you. Who has God placed in your life that you have the opportunity to speak encouragement into? Who can you speak life into? Amen? And let me give you some advice. The best place to start it with those closest to you and work your way out. Amen? So husbands, you're on the spot. Do you tell your wives how much you love them, how much you appreciate them? You're thinking, well, she knows it. I don't necessarily have to say it. I express it in other ways. And don't you love Hoy's song? Man, he's such a great songwriter. And there are many ways to express love. But the Bible says that the power lies in speaking it, in saying it. Amen. Build her up. Wives, do you speak encouragement into your husband, that strong, rugged, tough guy? that melts at your every word? Do you speak encouragement into him? Hey, I can tell you this. Words can make or break a marriage. Depends on how they're used. Parents, are you speaking life into your children? Yes, we have to instruct, we have to correct, and we have to discipline. That's our duty as parents. That's our job. But it's also our job to speak life into them. Understand your words... Mold and construct the person your child is going to be. Amen? And that's a heavy statement. But we have that responsibility to build those up around us. Listen, there are plenty of negatives in this world that are working on tearing them down. I can guarantee you that. Give them what they need to hear. Start with those close and work your way out. Listen, people are around us are starving for a good word. They're hungry for a compliment. They're thirsty for encouragement. Let's build them up in 2016. Amen? So one, more Barnabas, less Saul. Number two, more faith, less fear. Researchers say the most common expressed emotion is love. And again, it's expressed in many ways. But the second most expressed kind of caught me off guard. And that emotion is regret. The second most popular emotion, regret. And regret, regret is often accompanied by fear. It's often spurned on by fear. But regret is expressed through statements like this. Man, I wish. Yeah. Or I'm so sorry. Or if only. Mm-hmm. You know, and we all know that, that pain hurts. But regret has a unique sting. And here's why. It, it carries not only the weight of regret... But the weight of, I wish things were different. And the reality is, if I would have done things different, the results would have been different. So it's because of me. That's the weight that it carries. And, it carry, and, and, and you feel that personal responsibility for regret. I did this to myself. And hey, look, this Bible right here, this book, it's full of stories of regret. Hey, Adam and Eve regretted they had committed that sin when God came looking for them. Esau regretted giving away his birthright for a bowl of porridge or soup. Samson regretted the path he took and where he ended up. Peter, he regretted denying the Lord. Even, though, even after the Lord told him to. Told him that he was going to do it. He did it anyway. But no doubt regret is represented in our church house tonight. We all have stories of regret, some much heavier than others, but we all can relate and identify with it. Lord, help us to strengthen our faith and reduce regret in our lives. To to help stay away from the bad decisions. Help take advantage of the opportunities. Use them. Don't miss them. Hey, to to take a double check, a double take, and avoid mistakes that we've done in the past. Hey, sin packs a suitcase of regrets. 
Let's use 2016 as a year to build faith. Amen? Faith counteracts choices that fear and regret make. Hebrews 11.6 But without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God much, must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Faith. God requires it. To become a Christian, it takes a measure of faith to believe God says who He is and that He'll do what He said He'll do. Amen? And this verse says to please Him, we must have faith. After all He's done for me, after all He's done for you, don't you want to please Him with your life tonight? Listen, every Christian should have that desire to grow our faith. And not just enough faith to cash in on a get-out-of-hell-free card. Amen? But a faith that blossoms like spring flowers, brother. A faith that is the building block of our relationship with God. Listen, Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us, faith, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Verse 4 in that chapter says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Yeah. Verse 5 says, By faith Enoch was translated, and his faith was a testimony that he pleased God. Verse 7, by faith Noah was warned of God. Verse 8, by faith Abraham followed God. Verse 11, through faith Sarah conceived. Verse 20, by faith Isaac blessed Jacob. And this chapter goes on. By faith Moses is in there. By faith Rahab is in there. And so on. And in verse 39 it says, all of these mentioned here obtained a good report through faith. Amen. Is there any doubt in anyone's mind? God wants us to have faith. Amen. He wants us to grow our faith and to exercise our faith. And faith can be a noun or a verb, but it's at its best as an action word. Amen. Faith is an anti-venom of fear. When the old serpent, the devil, tries to bite fear into us, faith can overcome it. Amen. 2 Timothy 1.7, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and of a sound mind. Amen? If fear isn't from God, guess who it's from? Yes, sir. Amen, brother. It's from Satan himself. Faith is from God. Faith overcomes fear. Amen? So one, more Barnabas, less Saul. Two, more faith, less fear. Point number three, more attempts and less excuses. And I'll try to move quickly through these last two. But NHL great and legend Wayne Gretzky said this, you'll miss every shot that you never take. <laughs> Amen. That's a good statement. If you don't try, you're never going to succeed. If you don't attempt, you're never going to move forward. Greatness doesn't come from your comfort zone. We've all got to get uncomfortable at times if we're going to serve the Lord. We've got to cast out into water, sometimes maybe over our head. We've got to grasp some things that seem to be out of our reach. We've got to lay hold of goals that are just flat beyond us. We've got to win victories that are impossible to win. And you say, Johnny, those statements don't even make sense. How can you do the impossible? And you're absolutely right. It doesn't seem to make sense. And we can't do the impossible. But Jesus in Matthew 19, 26 says, With men... Some things are impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Philippians 4.13, and we should all have this one memorized, church. I can do all things through Christ, help me out, which strengtheneth me. Amen. Listen, it's not us who can do these things or take the credit for things we accomplish. It's through Jesus that we can do great things in our lives. Don't buy into that deception that it's only a select few that, that have influence. It's not just those with a big platform or a huge title that make a difference to others. Jesus expects us all to make a difference to those right around us. Amen? Although God prepares some to make a global impact, that's not for everyone. You don't have to think global to be used by God. Start impacting your family. Make a difference in your classroom or on your campus. Listen. Shine the Lord at your workplace. Be the witness on your ball team. Be the light in your neighborhood. Jesus says, live your life in a way 
that it impacts those around you. Amen? Many have told me, man, it seems like the Lord wants me to do something, or the Lord's given me this idea, or, or I have thoughts of this or thoughts of that, you know? And so if that's you, if you have an idea that you think the Lord has laid on your heart, if you have thoughts of, of service of some kind, you know, if you think God is prompting you to do something for Him, you know, maybe God's putting a call on your life. Don't ignore that invitation to serve. Amen? Make an attempt. Don't let failure or the fear of failure freeze you. Take a shot. Hey, learn from mistakes. Press on. Answer His call. Be the hands and feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, if you feel God impressing something on your heart, don't wait for an audience. Hey, nobody changed the world that sat around waiting for somebody to watch, waiting for an audience. They just started. Listen, even when nobody else notices, God will notice what you're doing. Amen? Don't seek the spotlight. Be willing to serve in the shadows. Now, at some point, God may put you in the spotlight, but that should never be your motivation to serve Him. Amen? Follow your God-given vision even when nobody buys into that. He'll honor your obedience. And I believe God wants us to dream. And I believe He wants us to, to dream big. Who, who can box in God? Who's that powerful? Who can tie God's hands? Who could do such a thing? Who can limit His power? Isn't it impossible? No, it's possible. Who can do that? Only you. Only you. And that's by not letting Him work in your life. By not believing that He can use you. Matthew 13, 58 speaks it out. And, and this speaking of Jesus said, He did not mighty works there because of their unbelief. Unbelief ties the hands of God. Hey, we have a wooden little carving on top of our TV. Um, and it's from the, the Bible bookstore. And it simply says, believe. Believe. God wants you to believe. Hey, He wants you to serve Him. He wants to use you, and He wants you to use you to make a difference to someone else. Use your faith to believe. Trust Him for the rest. Amen? Don't wait for an audience. Don't wait to be asked. Get in the game. Being a Christian is not a spectator sport, brother. If you're on the team, you have a role to play. I like a pastor in Nashville named Pete Wilson. Uh, he's got a, got a big church there, but he's a great author. I love his books. But I read a story he wrote about him and his son at the YMCA. He was running on a track that's above the gym floor. And his son was down on the basketball court. And he said as he ran, he could look down and see his son standing down there with the basketball under his arm, watching the older college guys play a basketball game. And he, he would, was running and, and lap after lap, his son was just standing there. And he was waiting for them to ask him into the game. And his son continued to stand there waiting for the next game, uh, and Pete thought, those guys are never going to ask my young son to play basketball with him. He's never going to get in the game. So he made another lap or two, and he thought, you know what? He's better off not playing with those guys. They're so much older, so much bigger. I'm sure he couldn't keep up. A few more laps were run. And then he noticed his son was out on the court playing with him and doing his best and somewhat holding his own against the older guy. And he said he finished his run and let his son play for a while. But as they left the Y, he told his son, I saw you playing with those college guys out there on the court. I'm surprised they asked you to play. Without pause, his son answered, oh, they never asked me to play. I just got tired of standing there and jumped in, started playing with them. <laughs> How great is that? How great is that? We should do that as Christians. Hey, jump in and serve. Man, find something going on and be a part of it. Jump into the action, amen? Don't you get tired of sitting around? Don't you get tired of standing and watching? Get in the game. Get in the game, amen? Don't let your impact be based on whether somebody invites you to do something or not. You seek something out. You find it and you do it for the glory of God. And Pete said, I love that attitude. He said, I'd rather apologize for tenacity than to regret being too timid in serving the Lord. Listen, there is a place for you to serve. There's something you can do. God's waiting for you to get in the game. Hey, stats show the teams that take the most shots usually win the game. Teams that pass the most make the most completions. 
Make it happen. Start somewhere. Excuses lead to regret, which we've already talked about. So more Barnabas, less Saul. More faith, less fear. More attempts, less excuses. My final point tonight, more gratitude, less entitlement. Listen, many believe if life were just a little different, they'd be so happy. They'd feel satisfied. They'd feel fulfilled. You know, if I just had that job, if I just made the money that they make, you know, if I had that spouse, if my kids behaved like their kids, you know, and it's a never-ending cycle of comparisons. If I have that car or that house or that boat, but you know what the danger is that mindset brings? God's not treating me right. That's what that brings on. God, why don't you give me what they have? Yeah. Amen. And it shows a lack of gratitude for what you do have, for the things you have been blessed with. And if we can make 1 Thessalonians 5.18 a bigger part of our lives in 2016, I guarantee we'd be much happier. What's that verse say? I'm glad you asked. It says, in everything, give thanks. Yeah. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Yeah. Hey, and that finger points back at me too. Concerning us. Hey, giving thanks. Being thankful. Having contentment. It's not about what we don't have. It's about what we do have that we should be thankful for. Amen. God's will, according to the scripture, is that you be thankful. Amen. The more you focus on what you don't have, the more you miss the blessings of what you do. And it's kind of like one of those balancing scales. The higher your sense of entitlement, the lower your sense of gratitude yeah. and vice versa. Hey, an entitlement has swept across our country. What can the government give to me? Hey, what can the church give to me? Where's my next blessing coming from? And the danger is people start to believe that they're owed something, that, they, that we owe them, that the government owes them, that the church owes them, that God owes them. And we as Americans have been very spoiled to God's blessings. Yeah. And in many cases, we stand around like this, waiting for the next thing to be given to us. Hey, waiting for God's next blessing. And when people aren't given what they want or what they perceive they deserve, what do they do? They whine, they grumble, they complain, they bellyache. Hey, and to the Lord, this must seem like a broken record. Man, it must seem like an instant replay of some Old Testament times. Listen, God had delivered his people out of the hand of Pharaoh, broken the chains of bondage and slavery for them, allowed them to take their families, their possessions, and their animals with them. He miraculously parted the Red Sea and they walked across on dry ground. He delivered, provided, and gave mercies and miracles to the children of Israel. Listen, yet that wasn't enough. Man, when they, when they didn't get exactly what they want, when they didn't get what they think God owed them or what they deserved, they got that entitlement spirit about them. They began to do what? To whine yeah. and to complain and to bellyache. Let me read it for you. Numbers 14, verses 1 through 4. Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and all the people wept that night. All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. Can you believe they wanted to return to the bondage and slavery and rule of the Egyptians? They, they, they were saying, forget God's plan. Forget Moses, God's man. We're better off in Egypt. I'd rather die in slavery than not be out here. How quickly did they forget? Amen. God's blessings and miracles. And it's easy to point fingers at them. But brothers and sisters, how quickly we forget the blessings and miracles that God has done for us. And I look around. This is a congregation of miracles. And I think of the things that God has delivered and brought us from and blessed us with, we are rich, amen? We've seen miracles, yet how quick do we complain and bellyache and often whine? And I'm glad our text tonight says his mercies are new each day. If not, we'd all be in trouble. Rod, Roger Edmund, Edmonds excuse me, wrote a book titled Simply Thanks. 
things. And in it, he talks about a study done over a 10-week period. Participants were split into three different groups. One group was asked to write down five things each week they liked or were thankful for. Second group, they were asked to write five things they disliked or didn't like about that week. The third group were just asked to write down five things that were random events of the week. So at the end of 10 weeks, after writing down the five things each, they were extensively questioned. The thankful group was over 25% happier and had a much better outlook on life than the other two groups combined. Listen, being thankful, being content, being happy is a choice. And I still remember Eddie Hicks from this pulpit preaching the message, I think myself happy. Amen? <laughs> and, and I think, what a wonderful resolution to write down five things each week that we're thankful for and then let God know it. Let him know it. Amen? Each week in 2016. Give him thanks and praise that he deserves. And now social media, especially with the young folks, everybody's on social media, you know? And I heard that if you added up the time spent by everyone in the United States in one month on Facebook, if you added up all their time together, it would total over 100,000 years per month. How crazy is that? That's too much. That's too much. Now, I'm on social media a little bit. I work with young folks. It's a necessity. But on my list of 2016, I've determined I want to tweet out at least one positive thing, one thing I'm thankful for each week of the year on Twitter. You know, if you use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, whatever you choose to use, hey, how about using it for God's glory once in a while? Amen? Use your social media maybe once a week, once a month, occasionally to give God some glory. Amen? Some need in 2016 a change of mind. Hoy mentioned a mindset change this morning in Caleb. You know, we need a mindset change of more gratitude, less entitlement. I like what Billy Sunday said to a new convert. He asked him to please be faithful to church. Take at least 15 minutes a day to let God speak to you through his word. Take at least 15 minutes a day and talk to the Lord through prayer. Take at least 15 minutes a day and share Jesus with someone else. I'd say that's 45 minutes well spent. Amen. Amen. So as we come to a close and I wrap this up, 2016 is upon us. 8,760 hours in a year. How are, gonna, how are you going to use that time? How are you going to spend those hours, those minutes, those days? Listen, it is helpful to set goals, to have resolutions, to have plans to serve the Lord. Point yourself in the right direction in 2016. And I pray we can have more Barnabas and less Saul. Hey, rain some encouragement down on those around you. Amen? More faith, less fear. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Let's grow 2016. We need more attempts and less excuses. The fields around us are white unto harvest, church. Let's get busy doing what he's called us to do. More gratitude and less entitlement. Listen, it's God's, will, it's God's will for us to be thankful in all things. We read it. So as they get a song, we don't know what 2016 is going to hold. But we do know this. We serve a constant, reliable God. Hebrews 13.8 says, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We can trust Him. And our text tonight says, Great is thy faithfulness. Your direction determines your destination. Which way are you headed? Some here need to turn to Jesus. Amen? Some need that new mindset for 2016, but that's your choice. God will do His part. God will be faithful. How are you going to live in 2016? I'm going to pray in just a moment. If you've got some things in your life that need prayer, we're going to invite you to come. You know, if you've got some things that you'd like to see God do in 2016, we're going to invite you to come. If you want to see God work in maybe a loved one's life in 2016, we're going to invite you to come. Listen, whatever the need, whatever the reason, there's no better place to start off the new year than on these altars seeking God. Amen? 
So as we pray, Lord, we thank you for your word. We praise you for your goodness, Lord. Help us to resolve to serve you better in 2016. Help those that are here tonight, Lord, that that need to make decisions, that, that need to make direction in their lives. Help them to have that courage to do so. We pray that you'd speak to hearts. Lord, and, and, and draw folks unto you. In Jesus' name we pray, and amen. As we stand, we invite you to come if the Lord's spoken to your heart. Sing this little song. The things that I love and hold dear to my heart are just far tonight.